Well, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Dr. K, and today I'm going to be talking about how Quai Network um, is thinking about using mine transactions um, as part of the protocol. So before we get started, like always, just want to give a brief intro to Quai Network. Um, and to start, we need to talk about what our goal is. And right now, um, there's a narrative within the crypto space that we need to figure out how to onboard the next billion users. It's a somewhat incredulous narrative considering that there are only 700 million uh, current traditional finance users. And our thesis is if we're gonna get a billion users, um, crypto first needs to work as money uh, before it works as a uh, niche sort of uh, finance and um, sort of like NFT applications. So the goal of, you know, Quai is to create a system that can can work globally as money. And to do that, we first have to talk about what our sort of requirements to scaling are to be able to function as money. And if we look at um, current payment systems, uh, we can start to create estimates of what currently exists and what we may need to be able to provide um, to uh, facilitate a money-like system. And we can quickly arrive at a requirement of uh, 50,000 transactions per second. How does Quai actually plan on achieving this? So Quai is a multi-chain architecture. It's a hierarchy of merge mined blockchains that can dynamically increase throughput while maintaining uh, security guarantees similar to Bitcoin. So if we look on the left here, we can see a first-gen blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum, where we just have a single sequence of ordered blocks. And on the right, we can see Quai Network, where we have our hierarchy of many different chains um, and uh, periodic interreferencing between those chains using uh, coincident blocks and deterministic hash linking. So we've had sort of a technical overview of the things that Quai is bringing to bear to achieve our target of 50,000 transactions per second. We've covered sharding, we've covered subnetting in depth, and now we're going to cover um, this concept of streaming, uh, and more specifically, how we can use mine transactions to enable um, streaming. And before we get started on mine transactions, we probably first just want to talk about mining. So mining is a process of economically committing to a set of transactions. So if we go through the process of being a miner, um, a miner will either be running a node or they will have access to somebody who is running a node. They will create a set of new transactions uh, that is building upon the current state of the chain and they will compute a new state given that set. This is what we would call a proposed block or a proposed header. And once they have a proposed block, uh, they'll start doing what we call grinding, which is the actual process of mining. So they'll take the header and they will look for a nonce, which they can pair with that header such that the hash of the header plus nonce meets a difficulty threshold uh, based off the number of leading zeros in the hash. So this is called grinding. Once they find a hash which meets the difficulty, they have a valid block. And then they will broadcast the net, that to the network. Um, the network will append it. And then everyone will start working on um, the new state update. And so that's just a continuous loop. So the key characteristics here of mining, though, are that every block is a unique commitment. So if I find a nonce for one block, I can't reuse that nonce and expect it to work for another block. Or if I have a block who is off by one transaction or the ordering of one transaction, that will create a completely different um, hash uh, with any given nonce, which won't create a valid um, mine block. So the nonces themselves in the process of finding the nonces are unique to the set of transactions in a block and to the block itself. And what this does is it creates expense um, with depth. So the more I dispose of resource into finding nonces, the deeper the blockchain goes, the more expensive it would be to 
modify something and then recreate uh, subsequent work of equal weight. Um, so over time, the blocks in these transactions uh, become what we refer to as immutable. The other key characteristic though is this is permissionless consensus. So there's no certificate authority, there's no process of getting ordained to participate in the validation and mining in the network. Um, anybody that has resource, anybody that wants to participate can simply spin up a node and commit their resources to the process of uh, validating and mining. One of the interesting things here that people often, I think, overlook is that proof of stake in, of it, in it of itself is a mechanism of authority or certification or um, permissioning into a system. Whereas the concept of a hash, um, basically if you're willing to put the electrons in, um, you're able to participate. So it's very unique in that regard um, in terms of who can participate uh, in the network. Um, so mining is an economic commitment attesting to the validity and it ultimately creates immutability of a shared ledger. So why does, what does mining accomplish? Mining allows distributed creation of valid ordered transactions. So when we talk about ordering transactions, um, you know, if I have two transactions, I have transaction A and transaction B, depending on <clears throat> who proposed a block, they could propose transaction A first and then transaction B or transaction B and then transaction A. Um, and what does it, what does the blockchain ultimately do in terms of um, determining which ordering is correct? Um, they ultimately make the decision of, are we gonna build on block A or block B? So within Quiet Network, we have our novel consensus mechanism called POEM, our proof of entropy minima, which allows us to, um, in a time invariant manner, deterministically pick a heaviest tip um, on which we should uh, subsequently build. So in this particular case, if we look, we say, the, the upper block, call that block B, um, you know, has a weight of 68 and the lower block has a weight of, huh, something happened to my waiting. Small mistake, one second. <laughs> um, All good. Yeah, this was supposed to just be 16, and this is supposed to be 48. Sweet. And we're back. So, <clears throat> the, the upper block, if you look, uh, has a lower weight than the lower block. So, what will end up happening is the network will instantaneously and automatically choose to extend the lower block rather than the upper block. And the upper block will be uncled, and then the ordering of transaction A and B will be determined as A prior to B, and um, we'll move on with the network. The other thing that <clears throat> miners are doing is they're creating an economic commitment to validity. Um, so we don't want to include transactions that don't follow the rules, and both the ordering of transactions as well as the validity of transactions is what enables us to accomplish things like preventing double spends. We, we can't actually do one without the other. Um, you, you need both ordering and you need validity to prevent double spends. Because if I have, um, for example, transaction A1 and A2, both of those could be quote unquote valid transactions if I don't have ordering or if I don't have deterministic ordering. So if I, if I don't have deterministic ordering, um, you know, one person might think that A1 is valid because it came prior to A2 and A2 is the double spend, while another person may think that, you know, A2 is valid because it, in their viewpoint it came prior to A1 and, and therefore A1 is a double spend. So you need both ordering and validity uh, to kind of have a working network. So the process of mining orders transaction in blocks and it also orders blocks in the chain in a distributed permissionless way. 
So what is minor extractable value or MEV? Minor extractable value is when miners make money by altering the ordering. And so a simple example of this would be front running. So let's say, for example, that Alice um, wants to swap ETH for DAI on Uniswap. She's going to create a transaction and let's say she's going to do a large amount. Um, with that large amount, there's going to be slippage. And so Bob sees this order after uh, Alice has broadcast it, but prior to inclusion on a block. So Alice will, or sorry, Bob will submit a new transaction uh, that he wants to get ordered prior to Alice's transaction, which will execute at a lower price or the current price, uh, knowing that Alice's transaction is going to cost slip. So he puts a transaction in, puts a higher gas fee in, and also converts ETH to DAI. Now, Alice, Bob's order executes, then Alice orders execute, which causes the uh, market price of ETH to DAI to increase. So then what Bob does, when that slip happens, Bob uh, creates a corresponding reverse order at the, the new price point and effectively makes a profit. And so front running is just a simple example uh, of what you can do when you can order or reorder transactions after announcements and prior to inclusion. And the reason that you can do this is because the ordering of transaction is incentivized and fee-based. So uh, Bob effectively pays higher gas um, to beat Alice, and the amount of gas that Bob can pay is effectively infinite. Now, Bob obviously wouldn't want to pay more gas than the um, <clears throat> opportunity that the MEV provides. But if there's multiple Bobs in the world, uh, they will start to competitively bid each other out until the amount of gas that they're paying um, is just below the amount of money they would make uh, by front running Alice. Now, the other thing that Bob could do is he could have a relationship with a miner or could be mining himself uh, to try to execute... Um, front running just by having um, network, um, or so, sorry, ordering of transactions that's sort of outside of the, the general consensus rules in the network. So MEV takes advantage of fee-based ordering um, to profit. Now the question is, why do we care about MEV? And what makes MEV bad? Is the problem with MEV is that it creates an incentive which competes with block incentives. So the behavior of a miner is wanting to operate so that they maximize value that is returned to them. And if the MEV reward exceeds the block reward, there's an incentive now not to cooperate. So if we look at this example to the right, again with the concept of TXA and TXB and two potential orderings, in a normal scenario like we saw previously, the whole network is going to um, pick the bottom block and, and keep on mining. However, in this particular case, instead of just immediately getting that top block uncled out, if the person um, that produced that uncle has sufficient hash rate, they actually have an expectation value, we'll call EC, to mine a new block C. And there's a potential that that new block will be heavier than the block um, that would have been canonically mined if everybody mined the, the bottom part of the chain. So for a miner, what they'll do is if the return value of being able to reorder the transaction B before A, by their expectation value is greater than the cost of mining block C, they won't cooperate. And so what we've created is a DSIC outcome that is non-cooperative. And DSIC stands for Dominant Strategy Incentive Compatible. Uh, it's actually the um, origin of the name of uh, Dominant Strategies, um, the company that's doing the development of Quai. But the, the point here is that self-serving uh, participants will no longer be cooperative if we have these MEV opportunities, which 
when they're multiplied by the expectation values um, are greater than our, our cost to mine. So we're maximizing our rewards by being non-cooperative. And so what this is showing is that we have a maldesigned system. And the reason that we have a maldesigned system is because there's two different ordering markets. There is a fee ordering market and there's a hash ordering market. So the fee ordering market is used to determine the ordering of transactions intra-block. So how the transactions are ordered in a block. However, another mechanism for ordering transactions is the order of the blocks themselves. But that market, the block ordering, is determined by the hash that's put into the different blocks. So we have two ordering markets. One is paid in fee and one is paid in hash. And MEV as an outcome which is potentially causing people to be non-cooperative is the consequence of the maldesign system. So MEV compromises finalization is a consequence of having two markets for ordering. So this is really bad for a system like Quai because we have a lot of shards, we've uh, sharded hash rate at the lowest level within zones, and what ends up happening is that means that those block rewards are gonna be smaller. And if you still want to have finalization that isn't uh, heavily influenced by these counter cooperative incentives uh, of MEV, you need to do something to start to mitigate MEV so that people will cooperatively uh, interact. So how do we mitigate MEV? So what we propose is that mine transactions allow deterministic intra-block ordering and decrease the MEV opportunity. So what is a merge mine transaction? So if you want to think about merge mine transactions, they're kind of like a fourth layer in the network. If we go back to the original um, topology of Quai, right? It's, it's three layers. You have a prime layer, you have a region layer, you have a zone layer. And if you want to think about uh, mine transactions, you can think about it as a fourth layer below zones, uh, which are effectively creating subshares of work that get rolled into a zone. So how do you functionally do that? If we look at what a subshare looks like here, is if I want to make a transaction, instead of just broadcasting a transaction with a signature, I'm also, I'm going to broadcast a mine transaction. So a mine transaction will have a normal transaction. It will have a transaction hash. But I'm also going to create a reference to um, the block that I currently think is the most uh, contemporaneous block in the chain, so the current canonical tip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the hash of that block into with my transaction hash, and I'm going to start mining on that block. And what that is going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to create a subshare, um, which most of the time will just be used for ordering the transactions in a subsequent block. However, some of the time we'll get lucky enough with that nonce creation that I will also create a valid block itself. So I'm using a cooperative mechanism of mining to create blocks as well as using that same mining to create ordering of, of the transactions in the blocks. And there's a couple really cool advantages to this too. And that what we're actually doing now is we're making a pre-commitment. So when I include what I think is the most contemporaneous block as a reference, I would say is block one. So I would start mining my transaction with block one, and at some point when I'm satisfied with the <clears throat> uh, difficulty of my subshare or the weight of my subshare, I will go ahead and broadcast that to the network. When I broadcast that to the network, it's gonna take some time to propagate, but what we can do is we can create consensus rules that say um, a mined share can only be, or mined transaction can only be included once it is at least one block old. And what that does is it means that there's now time for those transactions to propagate and out around the network before they get included in a block. And this is really important and we'll, we'll cover why that's a, a big advantage later, but basically it means that we can get local consistency um, of transactions and the ordering of transactions prior to the block actually being produced, which means we can have much less bursty transmission in the network and much, much less bursty computation in the network. Um, 
The other thing that it does is, and we'll go through this more, is it reduces MEV uh, and it directs the money that could be made from MEV to uh, producing hash or mining. And then the important piece here too is it also aligns the intra and interblock uh, ordering markets uh, by creating a single ordering market for both intra and interblock ordering, which is hash. So mine transactions eliminate MEV and create statistical uh, consistency of blocks prior to block production. Another piece that we have with um, mine transactions is that we can actually include the transaction share weight as part of the block weight. So if we go back to this example earlier, where we have uh, two competitive blocks, uh, one ordering transaction A prior to B and the other ordering B prior to A, um, we can actually create a new system wherein if the top miner is trying to then decide to mine C to try to beat out the chain um, who, who originally won on the fork in the bottom, what will end up happening is they won't be able to they won't be able to win because when we add the transaction weight in what we're doing is we're actually creating a more accurate measure of the hash so if i indeed arrive at my block by providing sort of the mean hash rate against that block i would actually expect delta s tx to be equal to delta s of the block itself so the intrinsic would be equal to the um, weight of the shares of the included transactions. And so the problem is if you have for, for the top person to win, they effectively have to get lucky and quickly find a higher intrinsic, but nobody in the network is going to be referencing the malicious actors block as they produce transactions, which can then subsequently get included in the following block. And what that means is that their value of Delta S T X will always be lower than if that was the block chosen by the majority of participants, which means their likelihood of getting C or their expectation value of succeeding and getting C at a higher total entropy than um, the sort of the canonicalized chain effectively goes to zero instantaneously. So no one would even do that because you're, if it basically, if you lose the first block, you're gonna lose the next block. So what this does though, is this creates a DSIC outcome that is cooperative. So now if I'm a miner and I lose on the B to A ordering, I already know that there's no payout here to try to keep mining um, a longer tip and sort of get lucky and win out. Um, so we have inter and interblock ordering by hash. And mine transactions with weighting goes from having uncooperative behavior to the DSIC outcome being cooperative behavior. The other thing that it does uh, for the users of the network is it makes the ability to do MEV work bound. So our ordering of our blocks are now bound by the amount of work we can do um, in a given time frame. So MEV transactions have a finite time now and uh, total hash that they can put on the network to try and reorder uh, a transaction in a block. So if we look, we kind of see these blocks here again with these subshares referenced. So this time interval from when people start referencing block one to when those subshares can get included in block three determines the amount of time that somebody could broadcast, try to reference one again so that they could reorder shares that are included in three but they must create a higher share value to be able to say front run a transaction. So the implications of that is that transactions which have MEV, the people that are making them should be producing shares with higher amounts of work. So if I have um, a Uniswap transaction and I know I'm swapping a million dollars, I'm effectively gonna want to provide a transaction with a lot of slippage. I'm effectively gonna wanna provide a transaction such that my expectation is that if somebody sees that MEV opportunity, that within that time frame, given a reasonable expectation of hash distribution, they're not going to be able to front run my transaction. Um, and if they do, it'll be a very, very high expense. So at some point, based off that time and expense, I'll get a guarantee 
that it won't be economically feasible to front run me and I'll be able to do that uh, because of this time component for much less than the actual um, total value of the potential map opportunity. So the other thing that happens here is that people that are trying to exploit MEV will end up spending their profits on hash. So instead of paying a high fee uh, just to get arbitrary transaction reordering, they'll have to actually spend it on hash uh, during that time window that they can exploit it prior to being announced or after it's announced prior to the transaction getting included. The other cool part about this too though is one of the unspoken um, issues with even Bitcoin is that transactions propagate around the network with um, sort of no DDoS protection. So people can do transactions, they can even do like RBFs and those transactions re replaced by fee and those transactions will circulate around the network and fill up everybody's mempool uh, only some of those transactions will be valid, but there's no limitation on circulation. So if somebody wanted to, they could create a bunch of competing um, technically valid transactions that like go around the network and they go around the mempool. So they can create a lot of traffic wherein only some subset of those transactions will actually get played. Um, and so their cost versus their impact could be very large, meaning that there's a, a distributed denial of service attack that exists um, basically in any blockchain um, that's doing fee-based um, transaction propagation. But in terms of um, what we're doing with MEV, we're basically using time and hash to bound the potentially potential for reordering transactions in blocks. And what this really is doing, if we want to create sort of a meta um, analysis of what is going on, is we're making a pre-commitment because when we're mining transactions now, we're pre-committing that transaction to what we think a canonical state is, you know, as we mentioned, block one in this case. And then once we've made that commitment to sort of the share level that we want, we broadcast that. And so now the transactions are pre-committed to, and they start propagating through the network but they can't get included to a block three. So by the time they can get included, we know the network has all of these transactions. Not only do we know that the network has these transactions, because the transactions by consensus must be ordered relative to their weight of their hash share, we also now have a consistent proposal of what the next block is going to be before the block is found. So block three will become statistically globally consistent and everyone will know what block we're trying to produce prior to block B being found, block three being even being found because we'll all have the same transactions and we'll all order them in the same way because we must order them in the uh, descending order of uh, mind share weight. So... <clears throat> That's a really, really cool phenomenon. And if you want to think about that, we're kind of condensing a block, um, kind of like a raindrop, right? So the block is sort of like coming together uh, as these molecules out of the air, transactions, and then when it finally coalesces into a drop and we find a block, everyone, those molecules were kind of already everywhere, right? So everyone has the transactions, they have the data references, um, and we'll talk about the fact that they can even potentially pre-compute the next state of the next block even before block three is um, determined. Um, yeah, which, which is the next slide. So <clears throat> what this allows us to do is this allows speculative execution. So speculative execution is the idea that I don't know what I'm going to compute next, but I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to compute next. So as this, all these transactions are propagating in the network, we're getting a greater and greater uh, statistical guarantee that we have all of the transactions that are possibly referenceable and everybody else also has the same set of transactions that are possibly referenceable and we're putting them in the same order. So we have a statistically consistent proposed block three prior to, prior to block three being found. And this allows us to say, hey, we're 95% confident that this is going to be block three. So we can go ahead and compute the state of the next block 
prior to block three being finished. Um, and if there are any deltas with what we compute and what is uh, finally canonicalized as block three, we can easily reconcile um, the deltas. So we can start to execute things that are going to be included in block three prior to block three being found. So consistency prior to block production enables what we would call speculative execution. So instead of having our blockchain's throughput limited by the time it takes me to compute the state after the block is produced and it arrives, I can start to compute the state all the time effectively. And then by the time the block arrives, it's just gonna give me a header and that hash and to say, here's the deterministic ordering. I'm gonna look, most of the time I'm gonna have the same ordering and I've already computed state, so I instantly have my next proposed block. So there's no burstiness of RAM, there's no burstiness of database reads and writes. We're, we're, we're off to the races immediately when the next block is found. Now, in some cases, that block will have some deltas over what my expectation is because we didn't indeed become globally um, consistent prior to block three being found. But in Quai, we're limiting effectively uh, things to um, addresses to one nonce per block. So that means they can only do one transaction. So only the only overlap that you're going to look at are potentially having to recompute something like a cooperative um, smart contract like Uniswap. Um, but that will be a limited set of recomputation uh, in the total ordering. So even if I do have to recompute, it'll, it'll be pretty efficient. So what are the practical implications? From a user's perspective, the average user, there's no noticeable changes. So even if you just have a smartphone and you're using an app to buy a coffee in a store, um, there's gonna be no noticeable change for you with a mine transaction because any IRL transaction is not memorable. So you don't really care about ordering, you just care that you get included in a block at some point in time but you don't really care about what order you're found in that block because buying your coffee doesn't create a million dollar opportunity for somebody to front run you buying that coffee. Um, so the implication of that is that you only have to provide a very minimal work share to get inclusion in a block. So maybe you're on your cell phone and it spends an extra second uh, creating a mined share prior to broadcasting it. Not a big deal. Now, if you're a power user, somebody that's doing swaps for a lot of money that cause slip or somebody that's trying to execute transactions um, that can be front run, you're going to be incentivized now to contribute hash to the network. And you're gonna potentially be incentivized to have your own hash power or have a hash pur purchase agreement with uh, a miner so that when you want to broadcast a transaction, you can get it ordered to the degree that you want it ordered based off of the potential slippage or MEV opportunity that you know exists with your transaction. But the net out of all of this is that we get fair execution for all participants and we now make the cooperative, uh, we now have cooperative mining incentives. And with that, I'll take questions. Dr. Kerr, would you mind just going back to that last slide really quick? I have one question for you. This one? Uh, there it is. One yep. after that? Yeah. Yep. And maybe you could just reiterate this. Why would a power user want to have their own hash power, you're saying, as to prevent MEV? But you said earlier that MEV is not really possible. Well, it's, design. It's, it's, it's still possible so let's say you do a transaction on uniswap and it's for a million dollars and there's four percent slip you've opened yourself up to potentially like a forty thousand dollar mev opportunity right um if you only do one or two hashes on that mine transaction and then you broadcast it somebody else can do more hashes than you and still front run you right so then you're going to end up paying them forty thousand dollars However, if you do, you know, a thousand dollars worth of work, you can create a share that statistically can't be beaten within the time frame between when you broadcast that share and when it gets included. So for, you know, um, what, 2% two, two of what you would be paying, um, 
the person trying to exploit Mev, um, you've prevented Mev from taking place. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. And while you've done that, that 2% you've spent on hash power and you've done it in a cooperative way. Right. Right, so if I'm a frequent tr trader and I want to be able to guarantee that when I do my trades, I'm not getting hit by Mev, um, I'm going to want to have my own... I'm going to want to have hash power at my disposal to create shares which can be met. So that means I'm going to either have the physical hardware myself or I'm going to be paying somebody to do it on demand when I need it to happen. 